yeah, so we can get started. Um, if you have any questions, drop them at this link, go.hackmit.org slash Slido. Um, yeah, I guess we can start uh, by introducing ourselves. Uh, I'm Kat, I'm a junior at MIT and I'll be one of the moderators. Yeah, and I'm Amanda, I'm a sophomore and um, <clears throat> um, I'll also be moderating. And Dr. Layton. I'm Tom. <laughs> and I guess I'll be answering questions. Great. Okay. So let's get started. Uh, I guess kind of as a little bit of a follow-up to your introduction of yourself, do you want to introduce uh, Akamai to us? Uh, sure. Akamai's mission is uh, to power and protect life online. Uh, business online. And uh, you know, we do that by uh, delivering a lot of the web content that uh, billions of people around the world consume and securing it. And so, you know, for example, pretty much all the major commerce sites you go to, all the banks, most all the media sites, not YouTube uh, and Netflix, but most of the rest of the video you get, um, you know, any of the big consumer applications online, what, what happens when you go there is you don't really go there, you get directed to one of our servers near you. Uh, and we have servers in 4,000 locations, including the MIT campus, that's one of the 4,000 uh, pops. Uh, and our server, that the job of that server is to get the content that you need really quickly through our platform and deliver it to you. So it's a really fast experience. And also to protect it, to make sure that, you know, the attackers uh, can't deface the website, can't bring it down with a flood of traffic and a denial of service attack. They can't steal your bank account or your Netflix account or your gaming account. Uh, you know, the, we check that it's, it's really you uh, logging in uh, you know, to your account before we allow access to it. Uh, and we're just now getting into stopping ransomware. In fact, we have services now that would have stopped pretty much all the headlines you read about, uh, that if those companies were using our new security services, they wouldn't have gotten hacked, uh, they wouldn't have had ransomware, wouldn't have lost their data. Uh, and our, our platform has now got 350,000 servers that are all coordinated in these 4,000 pops in 1,000 cities around the world. Uh, and we built our own virtual internet on top of the real internet. And our servers communicate through this virtual internet. Uh, and it, you know, the real internet is amazing in what it does, but the protocols change very slowly and, and they really weren't designed for today's usage of the web. And so that's why we had to build our own virtual internet on top of the real one. And we sell our services to the major websites, the major companies. Uh, and you don't see us, you're using us all the time. You don't see us because we're under the covers. Uh, if you were to do you know, digs or DNS lookups or trace routes, you could detect the content is us or where you're connecting is us. Uh, but otherwise, most people don't even know we exist. Um, yeah, okay. So I guess the next question is, um, in relation to today um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, how, is, how do you think it has changed the way people use the internet? And also how did that affect Akamai? Yeah, it's changing. Well, it's changing pretty much everything about our lives. Uh, obviously you've, you've all been through that. Uh, we had a good year of remote learning. At least you're back on campus now, which is, is nice. Uh, I, I think, you know, traffic has increased incredibly. Um, there's much more video watching. Uh, you know, we had a year's worth of growth overnight when people had to shelter in place uh, for, you know, video, OTT video and for gaming. And the software downloads associated with gaming just exploded. Uh, it's still growing uh, today uh, at a more normal pace year over year now that we're in our second year of the pandemic. Uh, commerce pretty much all moved online. Uh, you know, and the, the big commerce companies that had brick and mortar operations are still in trouble. You know, 
they're using much more of the internet, but they've lost a lot of their brick and mortar business. And I think a lot of that's here to stay. Uh, there's been a big shift to online for commerce. I mean, you know, it's, of course, these days, I don't know if, uh, I don't really go into stores much now. Uh, probably in some locations you can. Uh, if you wear a mask, it's reasonably safe, but a lot of places, there's a lot of COVID running around and, and a lot of people aren't going into stores. And so you do your shopping online. It's been a huge benefit to Amazon and the really giant companies. Uh, they've taken a lot of business from, you know, the, the name brand brick and mortar companies uh, that also have online presences, but they're losing share now uh, to Amazon. Uh, remote learning, uh, been a big deal, uh, you know, a long way to go there still, especially in the, you know, the primary and secondary levels. And of course, there's a lot of struggle with, especially the kids who don't get back, can't get vaccinated in a lot of states, don't wear masks. And so COVID spreading pretty rapidly. And that's, that's a mess. But, uh, you, you know, so I don't know how much remote learning is here to stay, uh, but it's, it's actively used today. Remote work, that's probably permanent. Uh, you know, our employees, 80% say they want to work remotely about 80% of the time permanently. And a lot of them, you know, want to be 100% of the time. And, and we've had a lot of employees move out of San Francisco to Oregon or Arizona, you know, pretty far away. Uh, so we're seeing some exodus from the big cities. Uh, into more comfortable places uh, to live. And we're going to accommodate that. I think most of the tech industry is going to accommodate it. You've seen some of the companies say you have to come back to work and they've, I think they pretty much all backtrack now in saying that in the future, yeah, you probably don't have to, or maybe it's a day a week or something. Uh, and I, I think that's permanent. You know, we won't really know until we're past COVID and it's the offices are open and it's safe to go back. Uh, you know, even if you get into an office today, you got to wear the mask and social distance. The cafeteria is probably not open. It, life is not the same. Uh, so even in those few cities where we have open offices, the attendance is very sparse. Uh, you know, and, and it's, it's not, not as fun, <laughs> you know, to be in the office. It's, it's tough. Uh, so I think that's probably permanent, uh, that there'll be much more remote work. And that creates a lot of flexibility. Uh, for how you manage your life. You don't have to commute. Uh, you, you know, if you got kids at home, you, you know, it's a double-edged sword, but at least you can maybe manage that, uh, you, you know, in an easier way. Or if you got, you know, older parents or that kind of situation, much less travel, uh, virtually no travel. And that makes, you know, a big difference. Uh, and so, probably a healthier lifestyle physically, instead of commuting, you can get on the treadmill. Mentally, it's tough, I think, you know, because you sort of miss the, the human interaction because there's a lot less. Now, you all are getting back to school, you get some human interaction, albeit some with masks. But in the business world, that's way cut back now. Uh, and it, it may be a while before it returns. We'll see. Um, you know, they just canceled the big media conference in Las Vegas uh, again. Uh, and I, I just wonder when there will be a time when you know, thousands of people decide they're going to pack themselves into a, a giant, you know, convention hall uh, where everybody's yelling at each other to get over the background noise. I, I don't know if that comes back anytime soon. So big changes in the world. Yeah, kind of as a follow up. Do you think um, the co sorry for the background noise? Do you think um, the COVID-19 pandemic has shifted Akamai's long term goals or the um, cause you guys to like innovate um, and change your product? No, you know, it turns out our products and, and roadmap were uh, very well designed for this environment because they were designed to scale suddenly for much greater use of the internet and to provide the security you need when you got a remote workforce. And, you know, another aspect of, of COVID is the attacks have increased enormously. Partly that's because the prize is bigger because all business is online. Partly because the targets are more vulnerable now because people are working remotely so that the, uh, the way enterprises are set up for their defenses, much less secure that way. Uh, 
so attacks are on the rise and our business was to stop those attacks. So there's no shift in our strategy. We did have to deploy a lot more servers, a lot more infrastructure to handle a, a doubling of traffic overnight. Uh, so there was that aspect, but, but no change in the strategy. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, and I guess uh, shifting more personally to you, um, how was your transition from being a professor to being um, the CEO of Akamai? And how did you how do you balance being like uh, in academia and uh, being a CEO? Yeah. So the, well, the transition uh, from academics to the company you know, happened over a period of a couple of years, you know, we worked on this as a research project at MIT. And then when we finally decided to create the company, we moved off campus. And I didn't become CEO uh, right away. That wasn't until, oh, I think, 13 years later or something like that. Uh, so it was a long time, um, you know, and it's a very, very different lifestyle, different reward structure, different working hours, uh, different stress levels. Uh, you know, being a professor is a, is a great existence um, and enjoy it a lot, uh, you know, and doing a startup company in tech is also pretty cool to do. And you have a chance to make a, a different kind of difference doing that. Um, but, but it's very different, uh, you know, lifestyle. Um, and then CEO, uh, that's different again, because the responsibilities are different and, you know, you're a public face of a, a company. Um, and that has, you know, has its own differences from being, say, a chief scientist, which is how I started out, where nobody really reported to me as chief scientist, although being a founder of the company, I have a lot of influence. But when you're CEO, it, that's sort of a different level of responsibility. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned about um, how Akamai started. Oh, sorry for the background noise. Um, but so... So if I'm correct, Akamai Technology started as a finalist in MIT's 50K entrepreneurship competition. And it originally focused on quick content delivery. Um, but today you have a separate division in your products for cybersecurity as well. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about more about why and how the focus on cybersecurity became more prevalent and what the pivot was like. You know, we always uh, were interested in security and, and back 20 plus years ago, when we started the company that was more around stopping denial of service attacks, uh, where just a lot of traffic comes to the site and we had scale so we could do that. We actually started the security business, sort of an interesting story. It was back in, um, I think it was the summer of 2001. And uh, we hadn't known at the time, but the code red virus was released. And uh, the code red, the government got a hold of it and reverse engineered it and discovered that it was uh, designed to uh, replicate and then on a set date, which was a few weeks in the future, uh, to attack the White House infrastructure and just flood it with traffic to bring down you know, the, the White House uh, from a digital communications perspective. Now, we didn't know any of that. In fact, at the time was all, I'm sure, very classified, but one day the, uh, President's National Security Advisor, who at that time was Richard Clark, showed up in our offices and um, told us about Code Red and said, you know, we think Akamai can uh, be used in a reverse way to defend the White House. And would you help us? And uh, it was, you know, out of the blue, he came. We didn't have any government business. Uh, we didn't know how he knew about us. <laughs> you know, we certainly hadn't reached out to them. And it's, the president's national security advisor. And so we, we looked at the problem and said, yeah, I think we can help and we'll help. And so what they did is basically we, we deployed our servers and sent all the White House traffic through to us. And then we, we blocked out the, the attack, which did come when it was designed to come and uh, protected the White House. And so that started our security business and started our government business. It was, it was very successful. It was classified for oh five or ten years, so we couldn't tell anybody. But finally, it did. You know, they let it out. Um, now, you know, to this day, the government is a large customer because we help defend them and other governments around the world. Our commercial security business really didn't get traction until 2012, 
Uh, and that was when groups out of the Middle East were uh, taking down North American banks and keeping them down. So they couldn't do banking online. And we'd always wanted to sell the services we were doing for the government to companies, but we couldn't get them to buy it. But when the banks all went down, they, they finally said, okay, we'll try Akamai because they tried everything else. Um, and they didn't, they did because to use us, they have to give us their secret keys. They're at their SSL certs and they didn't want to do that, but then they had no choice. Uh, and so, and we were able to defend them, got them all back up online and we, we were trustworthy with their keys. And so now, you know, banking is one of our biggest segments and we do security, you know, to pretty much across the world board, uh, all the big banks use us, uh, today to defend them. Wow, thank you so much. Um, sorry about what just happened with my video, um, but we're back. And we have a couple questions about um, the founding, the of the founding of Akamai. Um, so we were kind of curious, um, what motivated you to co-found um, this company? It was a last resort. <laughs> you know, we uh, I liked being a full-time professor, Danny Lewin who was my graduate student and co-founder. He wanted to be a professor full-time. You know, we had developed the technology which really in the form of algorithms and papers and publications. Uh, we had written code, uh, but we thought it could be really useful. And, you know, we initially had a model where we would sell the technology to ISPs uh, and that they would use it to accelerate the internet. You know, through the 50K program, we talked to a lot of ISPs and we couldn't convince them it would work. You know, they would talk to us because we came from MIT. But at that time, you know, the notion of distributed computing was an ivory tower concept. And that's what they said. You know, they said, go back to your ivory tower. It was a fun conversation, but everybody knows distributed computing can't work in practice. So we couldn't get anybody to use it and to use the technology, but we did believe it would work. And so the only way, you know, to get it out there was to start a company. Now, you know, it was a great time because it was during the bubble. We'd been through the 50K, we met venture capitalists, we refined a business plan. Uh, it, it was still a tough decision, you know, to sort of step out of academics and start a company because we had really no clue about business. We were, we were academics. And, you know, starting and running a business is a, is a whole different thing. We literally got books out of the library, business plans for dummies, you know, or how to write a business plan, uh, you know, to get started. And we did it because as mathematicians or, or theoretical computer scientists, it's rare you have a chance to really make a difference in practice. And we felt this was a rare opportunity. And the only way to do it was to set up a company and deploy the technology and then prove it out. And ultimately we, we switched our business model not to sell to ISPs and carriers, but to sell it to major content providers uh, as a service. Yeah, yeah, kind um, of as a, oh, oh, sorry. I did not mean to cut, no. cut you off. Go um, ahead, Kat. But there was like a kind of relevant question from someone anonymous who asked um, what the hardest technical challenge was that you run into. So I know you talked about maybe switching to business from academia, but were there any like technical challenges you ran into while co-founding Akamai? Well, there, yeah, a lot of technical challenges and we face them all the time. You know, the latest attacks that are out there, how do you defend against those? And, you know, we're up against powerful adversaries, major governments, organized crime, political hacktivism, you know, it's not just the prototypical hacker in the garage trying to, you know, make a splash. It's, it's big governments that are well-funded, very smart and very dedicated. And so we got to have really smart people figure out how to stay ahead of that to protect major enterprises. Um, so there's, there's no end of technical challenges. And that's what makes it, I think, really fun, you know, to develop the technology uh, that can you know, keep the internet, you know, safe um, and, and make it be fast, make it scale. You know, overnight traffic doubled on the internet. Uh, you know, and if we weren't there, that wouldn't have happened. 
you wouldn't have been able to handle it. That's when COVID hit, when it doubled. Um, so I guess kind of following up on what you're saying about how uh, there are new problems every day that comes with this field. Um, I'm sure a lot of people might know, but recently in the news, um, there was an organization called NSO Group that had exposed a vulnerability in Apple devices um, and released a zero click remote exploit spyware that was virtually invisible to users. Um, so I guess the question is, how do you adapt um, to new cybersecurity issues in a field where malicious people are continuously looking for new ways to expose these vulnerabilities and flaws? Uh, yeah, well, we all updated our iPhones right away. <laughs> you know? But, um, you know, uh, we had that challenge in the, the software we use, the software our customers use. Uh, and, you know, vulnerabilities are a big deal. And it's not just that, but you've got these governments embedding malware out there. You know, and that everybody today uses GitHub, all sorts of open source code. And the mantra has always been that open source code was safer because it was open source, you know, and you just assume that probably the reverse is actually true now because it's easy to go, you know, stick malware into it. And then people use it uh, and suddenly you put back doors and you, you, the vulnerabilities were intentionally created. And that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, and it's so much harder to defend to stop that kind of stuff than it is to attack. You know, to attack, you just got to find one vulnerability to get in, stick your stuff in there, and, and then it, it, it spreads. And you got a big problem. Um, you know, so I, 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 I think that's, that's what makes it really interesting. And we're constantly dealing with that. Uh, in our code, the code that our customers use, the code the major companies use, it's, it's all the time these vulnerabilities are, are being discovered. Heck, you know, I, I, one of the most famous ones was open SSL. You know, we, we all use SSL, you know, everything now is HTTPS and uh, open SSL, there was a, a change made. This was now probably the change was made seven years ago. And the change was just a simple fix to uh, do a liveness check to see is your SSL process run. And the way it, it worked is you would, you would send the process, oh, I don't know, uh, you know, it was, I think it was a kilobyte or something of data. And if it was alive, it would send you back the kilobyte. And that's how you knew it was alive. So simple change. Well, what nobody in the public world realized was that if you sent it with your liveness check, say, not a kilobyte, but a few bytes of data, it would send you back a kilobyte of data. Now, the question is, where is it getting the rest of it? <laughs> you know, because you only sent it, say, 10 bytes, and you got 1,000 bytes back. Well, the natural thing, the process would, is using looking up in memory, it, it stored the 10 bytes, and it just gives you the next kilobyte back. So all of a sudden you've got most of that kilobyte was something that was sitting there in memory for the SSL process. Well, what's in memory for the SSL process? The keys and the computation associated with it. And so by sending a simple query to anybody's SSL process, you could have a pretty good chance of getting their secret key back. Now, this wasn't publicly discovered for three and a half years. Right, <laughs> and you know, you got to believe that certain governments figured that out pretty quick, or I don't know, organized crime. And so, all secure transactions on the internet, you got to assume for three and a half years, were totally compromised from that simple open source update. It's just, it's, it's mind blowing, you know, the the status of stuff out there. Um, I'm curious um, what Akamai does. I don't know if this is something you can share to preempt um, like cyber attacks like that or um, like kind of unexpected attacks, how you guys might respond to that? That was actually a, a success story for us, you know, because, you know, 15 years earlier when we implemented SSL, 
one of our smart engineers, I'm sure an MIT, you know, a former MIT student said, hey, we probably shouldn't store the SSL keys in the, in the workspace for the SSL process. They should be stored somewhere else. And so our systems turns out weren't vulnerable to that, which was, we were pretty, pretty pleased with that. Uh, of course, our customers, uh, you know, they had impact and we had to help them. We had to rotate everybody's keys overnight because maybe, you know, they gave up the keys. Uh, and so we had to do massive changes. But we have large teams of people that all they do is think up horrible things that could happen and then put defenses in place to keep them from happening to us. They did this even before that the patch got put out that caused the problem. Well, okay. Um, <clears throat> actually, I'm, I wanted to actually touch on something that you said in the past, um, in a past interview, at least from what I've read, um, that um, firewalls are becoming obsolete. And you stated in the past that you encourage companies to abandon firewalls. Um, and I was wondering if you could explain more about why firewalls have become obsolete and how Akamai leverages technology to like chew the need for these firewalls. Yeah, uh, you shouldn't only abandon the firewall, you should replace it with something much better, which is uh, it's a, a, what's called zero trust today approach to enterprise security. The, the problem with a firewall is it provides access to the corporate network. Uh, and all you have to do is authenticate yourself. Now, today, it is just so easy for a bad guy to get malware on your laptop, on your cell phone, whatever device you're using to access the, the corporate network. And to access the corporate network, you, you, give, you, you log in and you give your password and maybe it's multi, hopefully it's multi-factor authentication. So you get a, a duo check and you click that and you're in because it's you and you're allowed access. The problem is it's your device that now has access. And unbeknownst to you, your device has malware on it. And access has just been granted to the corporate, the whole corporate network. Now, you're not going to some of these other applications, but your device is because the malware is doing it and you don't know it. And so the first thing the malware does is jump off of your device and finds a home inside the corporate network. And a great example for a good home is something like the air conditioning unit. You know, the HVAC system, which is connected, of course, today has, you know, full processor communication stack, the whole nine yards, because, well, maybe they want to control temperatures remotely or something, you know, over their corporate intranet. So now the malware is there. And then from there, the malware moves around and gathers all the data it wants from the company, and then it exfiltrates it. It sends it out to a botnet. Or if it's ransomware, it spreads around and encrypts all the data and all the other processes, because it can move around freely once it's inside, There's, it's, it's inside, it's trusted. And so that's why firewalls are not totally useless, but they really give you a false sense of security because you're not secure. And that's why there's so many data breaches today. Now, what you wanna replace that with is a zero trust approach. You know, you shouldn't trust anybody, it's certainly any device and give them full network access. You, you, you should only give them access to certain applications to which they have the rights to have access. And even then you shouldn't trust that the communication with that application is not trying to infect it or exploit a vulnerability in it. You gotta assume it's a, a bad guy you just gave access to that application and, and filter the communications or at least monitor them. It's like, you think about a big, Think about an MIT building or a building that, you know, you might get a key to the front door and maybe you get a key to your office, right? You get that, but you shouldn't get a key to everybody else's office or somebody else's file cabinet, right? You know, it should only be giving keys to the things you're supposed to have access to. And even better, you know, in the context of malware today, if you're monitoring that access, you know, to make sure that you're not injecting something bad in it. And, and that's what I mean by saying we, we should move beyond firewalls. 
Um, I'm just curious, but if I, so if I have like devices connected to like my Wi-Fi, like, and I like live in a smart home, for example, you have the doorbell and everything. How would I keep my home safe in the modern day? Um, if that's the current system I have. Yeah, it's, it's not safe because <laughs> you know? most of the devices in your home, a lot of them won't have a password or if they do, it's corporate, you know, comp- it's presets. Everybody knows what it is. One, two, three, four or something. Uh, you don't, if you can change it, you may not think to change it uh, and easily exploit it. In fact, all those devices in the homes are being used as part of botnets today. Oh, interesting. So I should scrap it all. Well, that, I don't know if you should scrap it all because it's it's cool to use, but yeah. the bad guys are using it too. Okay. Um, you know, as okay. bot to attack and do do bad things. Yeah, that's that's good to keep in mind. Um, that's really interesting. I didn't. I don't think I've ever heard about that. Um, okay, cool. So, to kind of switch directions a little bit, um, we were kind of curious. Um, what career advice do you have to give to college students um, being a college professor yourself? Well, um, yeah, obviously learn everything you can. Uh, this is a great time, you know, to do that. College is about having fun too, but, you know, you also, you want to learn. Um, you know, I remember advice given to me when, oh, I don't know, I was probably around that age and uh, it was a, a famous person at the time ages ago. And his advice was, as you go through life, uh, keep your eyes and ears open and your brain turned on because you never know when there's going to be an incredible opportunity to make a difference and to make things better. And, uh, you know, if you got your eyes and ears open, you'll you'll absorb it and then your brain turned on, you'll process it and you can actually do something that makes a big difference. And especially this is good advice for this group because you've got a lot of really, really smart people here. Uh, and this is, you're the folks that'll be making the advances in the future. That's very true. <laughs> um, but also as a follow-up question, um, along a similar line, uh, what advice would you give to students interested more in pursuing cybersecurity in that field? I, oh, I think that's a great field. Uh, you, you know, it'll be great for jobs. You just, you can't hire enough people with that skill set. Uh, you, you know, it's just incredibly competitive uh, for companies to hire um, people that understand cybersecurity. So that's a, a fabulous uh, career opportunity, and that will be for a long time. And it's exciting. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it really is. And I know there are some really great classes at um, MIT that teach cybersecurity. Um, so you're an MIT student, you should take those classes. <laughs> um, I've just been kind of looking at some of the questions that we've been um, uh, given on the Slido. Um, and JK has asked uh, what your thoughts are on the future of cybersecurity regarding quantum computing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, quantum computing is sort of like my, my, my view, like cold fusion, you know, it's a, a fabulous, fabulous advance that uh, is nowhere near really happening, uh, but would be great if and when it does. It changes the paradigm of computing. It's very, very cool. Uh, they, you know, have machines that can do the equivalent of a few transistors. Uh, one of the things that is nice about it is that if you could really build one, uh, you could factor, and that breaks all the public key crypto systems. A lot of the public key crypto systems get broken if you could do that, uh, which is cool and would be interesting. And that's why the governments really care about it and why they're investing so heavily. Uh, but we're really nowhere near that at scale. It's uh, sort of like popular science. You know, movie stars talk about quantum computing, uh, you know, but it's. I, I, don't, I don't think it's really uh, around the corner. Um, interesting story, my first graduate student, uh, Peter Shore, he's the one that uh, later discovered how to factor using a quantum computer, which really kicked off all the excitement about quantum computing, because then you could crack crypto systems. Wow, that's actually really cool. Um, and yeah, the future of quantum computing is a little up in the air and you know we're probably really far away from harnessing that. 
um, technology in a lot of areas. Um, but yeah, I think, um, Amanda, do you think we should shift entirely to the Slido questions now? Yeah, we actually have like uh, quite a few questions coming in. Um, and I guess to kind of piggyback um, off of the last question about the future of cybersecurity, more in general, how do you think the internet will change in the future? Um, this is a question from Alina. I, I think the, uh, the next big step is uh, 5G, which will have a lot more devices connect and there'll be a lot more throughput, lower cost, uh, be really powerful in the less developed world. Uh, and I, I think it'll enable a, a whole new generation of applications, especially IoT applications, because uh, you, you'll suddenly have a factor of 100 more devices that connect. You know, literally the tennis balls you hit will be connected, your tennis racket, your sporting clothes. You know, you'll be able in, you know, real time if you want to see how your form compares to Roger Federer or pick your favorite tennis star. They already have golf balls that are, you know, connected uh, where you can, you know, see spin, flight, all that kind of stuff. Just everything could be connected and you'll have real-time processing to do applications we can't even begin to think about. It, it, I think it'll sort of be like what broadband did where, for example, we've got social networking, uh, applications like we're using now, uh, which were unimaginable uh, back before broadband. And so I, I think it's the, the next generation like that. Uh, will be really exciting. Yeah, and it's really interesting to consider that um, with what you said earlier about firewalls and how we don't currently have like a system for everyone to have all this tech without exposing their data or themselves to malware or um, people with bad intentions. Um, so it would be interesting to see how cybersecurity develops alongside those technologies. Yeah, no, the problem is you're going to need cybersecurity even more because those devices become a weapon for the attackers. Right. Yeah. How do and you well, secure it? Like countless items. Where does, where does it end? <laughs> right. Um, so there are actually a couple questions um, that are kind of run in the same vein. Um, one from Mark about 20 minutes ago. Uh, Mark is asking, what are the key responsibilities a CEO needs to have to manage a company? And what talent are you looking for within your employees? Well, you know, there's all different kinds of the CEOs. Um, you know, some come from the business side, some come from the technical side. Uh, you know, I'm more on the technical side and learned, you know, the business uh, side of it. Um, you know, when, in terms of looking for employees, we're, we're looking for, you know, smart people who, uh, you know, like solving hard problems, like working with a team. You know, our culture at MIT is very much like an, uh, sorry, at Akamai is very much like an MIT culture. Uh, smart people like to work together, like to solve hard problems, believe that you can solve anything uh, if you work hard enough uh, and want to make a difference, you know, to make things better. Um, we have a very open and transparent culture uh, you know, so it's low on bureaucracy. Uh, you know, it, you know, the, one of the internal sayings is it doesn't matter the rank of the person who said something for an idea, it matters the quality of the idea. And so literally the youngest person in the company can win an argument with a CEO based on the merits of the argument. Um, you know, and that's very much like an MIT culture. It's, it's about the science, about the, the quality of the, of the ideas. It's about proof, you know, and so in the mathematics side, it, can you make a convincing argument that what you're saying is true? Um, you know, and so that's, we're looking for people that like that culture. It's, it's low on ego and, uh, you know, high on, on teamwork, uh, being, uh, you know, inclusive is very important for us as well you know, for the, for similar reasons. Okay. Um, another question that we have is what are your thoughts on cryptocurrencies and blockchain specifically regarding cybersecurity? We um, have a blockchain network. Uh, we did a joint venture with a, the largest Japanese bank um, in early days there. Um, cryptocurrencies, you know, uh, 
Yeah, they seem to be uh, catching on. They are, seem to be wildly speculative. Um, it is an interesting concept. Uh, you know, I, I think governments aren't don't like it because it's it's a way for criminal activity to be hidden, and governments increasingly don't want that to happen, and they also want to tax activity. Um, and so, you know, they're they're not so wild about blockchain. I don't talk about uh, cryptocurrencies. Blockchain itself is is just fine. Um, you know, so it's it's interesting interesting to watch. Our blockchain approach is not the traditional one because proof of work is just too expensive. It's a hard you know way to you know to do things, and so we have a different approach based on proof of authority that's much more efficient. So it can really scale effectively to do, handle microtransactions. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and yeah, I think in one of our earlier tech talks or work fireside chats, there's a whole discussion about the um, sorry crypto bubble. So um, it's cool to hear your take on that as well. Um, yeah, one of our one of our developers been with us for a long time. Uh, in the very early days, I think he got thousands of uh, you know. Uh, you know, bit uh, of the of the currencies, and now would be worth tens of millions of dollars. But he lost his key. I've actually heard a lot of stories about situations like this, where somebody um, kind of invested really early in Bitcoin, um, and then no longer has access to the email that they stored their key with, or just have lost the key altogether. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting to hear. <laughs> Another um, question that was asked um, by, sorry, I've just had it by Nivi, is if you have any recommendation for or recommendations for books to read to expand our pers perspectives about tech and how it can solve problems. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, I don't know what to suggest. I don't. You know, read a lot of those books. I will more read detective novels or espionage novels. So any good ones that you can recommend right now? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. There's good to great is a good business book. Um, you know, as it comes to mind, uh, that's one I read and that we gave to our employees. Um, you know, there's a book about uh, Danny Lewin, who's Akamai's co-founder, called No Better Time. And that was a good book. Um, you know, it talks about his life and then, you know, the founding of Akamai up, up until September 11th. Um, and Molly Raskin's the author, and she did a very good job of that. But that talks about the whole experience of founding a company and sort of the craziness involved in some of that. Wow, yeah. Um, I guess I will have to pick up some of those books. Um, to read. I'm always in need of good book recs. <laughs> um, another question that we have is, what do you think of the future of user authentication um, needs to do in order to adapt to increased traffic? Increased traffic. Or, so yeah. so uh, you, user authentication is proving you are who you say you are, uh, as how I would interpret that. And actually, we do that now <laughs> as a service. I mean, you gotta know your um, ID, your password, have your MFA, uh, ideally, uh, although MFA is not typically used in commercial applications. It's used in business applications, but not so much commercially. But we track a ton of stuff ab about uh, users so that when they do log into their bank account, we know in real time, is it really them or not? And first thing we do is we wanna make sure it's a human. And so we, we track how you hold your device, you know, how you navigate, um, you know, if you're tapping, you know, the device, the gravitometer is actually moving, uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, that was incredibly successful, but then the bad guys figured out how to, you know, get past that. And so, the, and actually, Ultimately, they now hire humans in third world countries to uh, actually be humans logging in with the stolen credentials so that we, you know, we know it's a human. And so we've had to do other things to know, is it the right human that's uh, logging in? 
Um, and we're doing, you know, I'd say pretty well there at stopping a huge fraction of the account fraud. Today, almost all login attempts are fraudulent for any, any bank or commerce company, any big media company, the vast majority. We, we stop a billion fraudulent login attempts every day. Uh, on a global basis. It's incredible what's going on out there. Organized crime is such a big business now, taking over the accounts. Wow, that's crazy. One billion, uh, that's a little frightening. <laughs> yeah, no, it's because uh, your, your, your passwords and all have been stolen for well, in a lot of places. And you tend to use, we all do, we use the same ones on you know, different yeah, websites. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what they do. As soon as they get a stolen credential, they try it on thousands and thousands of websites to see if they got a match. And then if they do, they sell that to the next entity that exploits that particular website match. Interesting. Wow. Um, that's a lot to consider. <laughs> um, to kind of bring it back to that conversation about firewalls, um, Corey has asked, what you think are some good zero trust procedures we can implement ourselves? Yourself. Ah, uh, that's hard. I, you know, it's hard enough for a big company to defend themselves. As an individual, um, you know, that's a hard thing, I, I think. I think individuals are pretty exposed because, you know, anytime they're dealing with a website, which they are all the time, you know, it, it gets, it can be compromised. Um, heck, you can go to a normal website and today with Magecart like attacks or malware that's embedded in open source code or in third party sites that a website links to, uh, you can, you know, import malware and, and have no idea. Just going to like British Airways had that happen. Um, you know, that if you went to British Airways to buy a ticket or do whatever, as part of just going to their website uh, without your knowing it, malware would come into your browser, take your credit card and all your information and send it to the bad guys. Uh, and that was going on for months. And ultimately they, they found out and the EU fined them a quarter billion dollars for a violation of privacy, even though they weren't trying to violate privacy rights. Uh, but so many people you know, lost their, their credentials, but that's happening all the time. Um, you should assume anything you do is captured um, today. Now, you probably yeah. are not directly a major target, at least mm -hmm. for espionage, but, you know, credit card, everything else you do. Yeah, uh, to kind of expand the scope of that, like how do bigger companies um, ensure that their data is kept safe? And um, do they or like how can companies shift to zero trust procedures? Um, yeah, there are companies like Akamai that offer new solutions uh, and you need to, they need to move to those, but they, they're doing that slowly and you'd be amazed at how unprotected big companies are. I mean, you know, Colonial Pipeline, you know, that thing that caused big gas lines because they got hit by ransomware and took down half the gas supply in the US for five days. You know, what, what happened there is they didn't have multi-factor authentication just ID and password. And not only that, they shared <laughs> ID and passwords for groups of people. And sure enough, one of them, one of the ID and passwords gets out into the dark web and somebody picks it up there, uses it to get in. And of course it's a firewall, so it's network layer access. Then they can go wherever they want inside. There was no detection, no nothing, no zero test. You just go wherever you want. And so they took the ransomware in, froze, froze everything and uh, encrypted everything uh, and then sent the demand letter. And ultimately they got paid millions of dollars after you know, Colonial paid them after shutting down the gas, half the gas for the country for five days. You know, that's just, it, it's incredible. A company of that scale was that easy to penetrate. That wasn't even a hard, Thing to do. Um, yeah, it's um, a yeah, bad situation out there. You, everything, you should just assume everything is by and large available and they're not necessarily getting it from you. They're getting it from the, uh, the big companies that have the data, the big hacks out there. You know, they, my medical history has been stolen. My IRS, you know, uh, tax filings happened twice now. <laughs> 
So people have stolen that at the IRS and filed false returns to get refunds sent to them. Um, you know, all their financial transactions have been taken. You know, the you know the the big hack of a company that literally every credit card transaction, certainly in the U.S. and probably most of the world, for years was taken. You know, the big hotel chain hacks. They now know as a big fraction of all hotel stays, who stayed where, when, and what room they were in. It's remarkable the information that is that certain governments now possess. And with that can do all sorts of bad things. Wow, um, that's pretty alarming, I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, I think we've kind of run out of time for more questions, but I just wanted to wrap up by thanking you so much for coming. Um, it was really exciting to have you here, um, especially since um, you have such close ties with MIT. <laughs> um, so it's good to get to know you a little more and I hope everyone in the audience um, learned some things and enjoyed themselves. And um, yeah, and for those of you on the live stream, thanks for popping in also. Um, yeah, I think that just about wraps up this fireside chat. Um, hey, well, and if, oh, was, wait, sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Go for it. <laughs> no, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, uh, Akamai is hiring especially smart people in cybersecurity. There you go. <laughs> so uh, please consider that. We have internships too. <laughs> yes, check out Akamai's career postings. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> They're the big building right by campus. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And if there are any other people from Hack, um, or participating in Hack this weekend on this call. Um, you might have noticed some people pop in. Um, stick around on this Zoom for the Microsoft workshop. Um, and yeah, thank you guys all so much for coming. It's great to have you here, Tom. Um, I enjoyed myself. So. <laughs> great, well, it was fun. So thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye bye. <laughs>